Hey, you found us. Welcome, everybody. This is Scripture Gems. Hello, and welcome to the show. My name is John Fulmer, and this is my brother Jay. How's it going, John? We are two brothers who just can't get enough of the scriptures. Yeah, we love them. This episode, we are going over the Come Follow Me lesson for January 2nd through 8th, 2023. This is covering Matthew chapter 1 and Luke chapter 1. And now let's bring out the star of the show, the scriptures. Oh, hello, Scriptures. So nice to see you. And now let's consult the Scripturematic 6000 to find out how long it will take to read this week's reading. 12 minutes, 55 seconds. Oh, my gosh. That's so short. What would it be daily? 1 minute, 50 seconds. Oh, come on. We can do it. What a great way to start the year to read the entire block for the week. Here we've got time codes if you want to take it section by section. It's not chapter by chapter this week because those chapters are kind of interwoven. So we'll just mark it up by section and you can check it out there. Otherwise, buckle up and we'll talk about it all together. But right before we get started, remember that a link to a PDF of all our quotes and graphics, as well as links from the episode, can be found in the description section below the YouTube video. We hope these will help you in your study. Also, there is an audio-only version of this podcast that is available wherever you subscribe to podcasts. Right. It's been more than 400 years since we finished the Old Testament in Malachi. That's odd. It feels like it's only been about three weeks. Oh, yeah, I guess it has. Hey, here we are in the New Testament. How did we get here? What's been happening since our last prophet in the land of Judea? To answer that question, we've made a video. If you haven't seen it yet, we really recommend that you check it out this week and share it with friends. It's all about what's called the intertestamental period. The information therein will really help set the stage for the New Testament. Now, there's a unique challenge this year since we are starting with the Gospels. These are four books that each teach about the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. Hey, John. Have we got a pretentious $4 word for the collection of the four Gospels? Come again? Well, you know, we have the five books of Moses, and we call them the Pentateuch. I was wondering if we just had a word like that that covered the four Gospels. Ah, yes. The word that you are looking for is tetraevangelion. Ooh. It literally means the four, or tetra, books of the good news, or the Gospels. Nice. Now, when considering the four Gospels, there is no evidence that the authors ever intended their testimonies to be side by side in a New Testament. But here they are. They were meant to be read as their own document, their own testimony. They contain historical facts, but they are not primarily historical books. It might be best to think of each as teaching theology in the form of a narrative, As such, each author has unique messages about the theology of Jesus that they want to share to their respective audiences. For more on this, check out our video on Understanding the Message of the Gospels, an introduction. Excellent. Now this year, instead of looking at the individual messages of the Gospels, we are going to study them as a harmony. That means we will attempt to combine the messages of each author into a single story. Where possible, we'll strive to point out unique elements of each writer. So we will begin with Matthew and Luke, the only two gospel writers to record information about the birth of Jesus Christ. We will explore unique features as well as looking for unification in the story. So let's begin in the book of Matthew. Let's take our introduction from the 2016 Seminary Manual. Matthew, also known as Levi, the son of Alphaeus, is the author of this book. He was a publican, or tax collector, before his life changed forever when he responded to Jesus Christ's invitation to follow him. Following his conversion, Matthew became one of the Savior's twelve apostles. As an apostle, Matthew was an eyewitness to many of the events he described in his record. This is supported by the title given to his gospel in the Joseph Smith translation, The Testimony of St. Matthew. Matthew appears to have written to a Jewish audience to show that Jesus Christ fulfilled Old Testament prophecies concerning the Messiah. As Matthew recounted the life, words, and deeds of Jesus Christ, he frequently referred to Old Testament prophecies and used the phrase, 
that it might be fulfilled. In his gospel, Matthew employed the term Son of David twelve times as testimony that Jesus Christ was the rightful heir to King David's throne and the fulfillment of messianic prophecies. Matthew's genealogy of Jesus Christ traces his lineage through David, Judah, and Abraham, demonstrating Jesus' right to rule and his role in fulfilling God's promises to Israel. Some of the most beloved passages of the Bible are found in the book of Matthew, including the Sermon on the Mount and many of the parables, teachings, and miracles of Jesus Christ. Though a large amount of Matthew's material is also found in Mark and Luke, about 42% of Matthew's gospel is unique. A major theme in Matthew is that Jesus Christ came to establish his kingdom on the earth. Matthew mentioned the kingdom of heaven numerous times, and he is the only gospel author to have included teachings of Jesus that mention the church. Let's take some additional information from the Institute Manual. It says, The Gospel of Matthew helps us see parallels between the ministries of Moses and Jesus Christ. Both were saved as infants from attempts of a king to slay them. Both came out of Egypt. Both came to deliver their people. There are five books of Moses, and Matthew recorded five great sermons that Jesus Christ gave. Moses revealed the lesser law... Jesus restored the higher law, fulfilling the law of Moses. Matthew seems to have organized his gospel in a way that would have helped his Jewish readers recognize Jesus Christ as the fulfillment of Moses' prophecy, The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me. Unto him ye shall hearken. If you had a chance to write a gospel, a testimony of Jesus Christ, What would you want others to know and why? What things about his life and ministry are most valuable to you? And here's another question. Would how you tell the story of Jesus differ considering who your audience was? As scholars look at Matthew, they find a lot of clues that he is writing to a Jewish audience familiar with Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah. Look at how many clues we see about Matthew's intentions as we read chapter 1. Matthew begins his testimony by establishing Jesus as a descendant of the great King David. Let's take a look at verse 1. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Now, this single verse is an important element of demonstrating that Jesus, the son of David, is the promised Messiah. This had been prophesied hundreds of years before his birth. Yeah, let's take a look at 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 12 and 13. The Lord is speaking to David through Nathan the prophet. In verse 12 he says, And when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build an house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And what about Isaiah? Let's look at chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. And what about Jeremiah 23, starting in verse 5? Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. In his days Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is his name, whereby he shall be called, the Lord our Righteousness. The genealogy in this chapter is structured in a very special way to demonstrate a pattern. For further insight on this, let's take a look at the Institute Manual. It says, 
Some scholars have suggested that Matthew's inclusion of three sets of 14 generations was purposeful and is significant because the number 14 is associated with the name title David. Hebrew and other ancient languages used letters of the alphabet to represent numbers as well as sounds. The Hebrew letters in the name David carry a numeric value of 14. The letters in the name David, D-V-D, are 4 and 6 and 4, equaling 14. Since the promised Messiah was to be born into the lineage of David, some scholars have speculated that Matthew may have divided the genealogy as he did to subtly emphasize that Jesus Christ was the long-awaited Davidic Messiah. Also, the number 14 is double the number 7, which is the number signifying perfection and completeness. Jesus Christ is the embodiment of divine perfection and completeness. Right. Notice that verse 17 summarizes the first cycle of 14 generations, taking you from Abraham to David, then another 14 to the Babylonian conquest. Abraham, David, and the Babylonian conquest were three major events in the history of the Jews. Matthew seems to be pointing out that these events happen every 14 generations. And 14 generations from the Babylonian conquest? The birth of Jesus the Messiah. Now, if you studied the Old Testament with us last year, you might recognize quite a few of these names. But you might also notice that some of these names are spelled differently than they are in the Old Testament. For example... Look at verse 2. Jacob begat Judas. Why is it Judas instead of Judah? Or in verse 3, why Thamar instead of Tamar? Or perhaps my favorite in verse 5, why Booz instead of Boaz? Remember that the Old Testament was originally written in Hebrew. The New Testament, including Matthew's Gospel, were written in Greek, And just as English names change slightly when represented in a different language, for example, John becomes Juan in Spanish or Johann in German, Hebrew names will take on slightly different spellings and pronunciations in Greek, but they're still the same name. That's a really good point. Something else is quite interesting in Matthew's genealogy. Let's take some commentary from the Institute Manual. It says, Several women are mentioned in Matthew's pedigree of Jesus Christ. Tamar was from Adullam in Canaanite territory. Rahab was a Canaanite of Jericho. Ruth was a Moabitess before converting to Judaism. And Bathsheba was the wife of Uriah, a Hittite. Thus, all four were either non-Israelite or associated with non-Israelites. What can we learn from Matthew's inclusion of these four women in the genealogy of Jesus Christ? First, it demonstrates that God had worked through Gentiles in the past, thus preparing Matthew's readers to appreciate the commission to teach all nations that would come at the end of his gospel. Second, the mention of these particular women, each of whom figured in a controversy of some sort in the Old Testament, shows that in Israel's past, God had worked through people and situations that the Jews would not have expected, thus preparing Matthew's readers for the account that is immediately to follow, Mary and the virgin birth. Now, I think this is a really great observation. If a religious Israelite were to come up with ways that the Messiah would come into the world, I can't imagine that he would have come up with what actually happened. How would you prepare the minds of the Jews to come to terms with a story that the Savior and Messiah, awaited for thousands of years, would be born and raised in backwater towns no one pays any attention to, and by a teenager who gets pregnant before she is married and gives birth to this baby in a manger among the animals? Really? That's not what I'd expect. And I think that's just the point. Matthew is setting the stage before telling this story by showing how this is not unusual for God to work in ways that were unexpected. But even though the way that God worked through these women may not have been well understood in their time, the Jews now venerate these women and the work God did through them. So, I think Matthew might be saying, don't be too hasty to judge this account. 
One last note on the genealogy. There is a lot of discussion and debate about how Matthew and Luke's list of the ancestors of Joseph differ. If you are interested in more on the subject, I would refer you to the Institute Manual, which has some good information on the subject. But for our purposes, here we agree with Elder James E. Talmadge from his book, Jesus the Christ, when he said, quote, The all-important fact to be remembered is that the child promised by Gabriel to Mary, the virginal bride of Joseph, would be born in the royal line, end quote. Great point. Notice what Matthew says in chapter 1, verse 16. And Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. Now, the seminary manual gives us this reminder that the word Christ is the Greek form of the Aramaic word Messiah, which means the anointed. This is the central tenet of the testimony of Matthew. Jesus is is the Christ. Now, before we continue the account in Matthew, let's visit Luke to explore some events that prepared the way for the story of Mary and Joseph. For our introduction, let's turn to the 2016 Seminary Manual. It says, Luke is the author of this gospel. He was a physician and a messenger of Jesus Christ. Luke was one of Paul's fellow laborers and Paul's missionary companion. Luke also wrote the book of Acts. Luke intended his gospel to be read primarily by a Gentile audience, and he presented Jesus Christ as the Savior of both Jews and Gentiles. Luke is the longest of the four gospels and the longest book in the New Testament. Some of the most well-known stories of Christendom are unique to the gospel of Luke. The circumstances surrounding the birth of John the Baptist— the traditional Christmas narrative, the story of Jesus as a 12-year-old boy in the temple, parables such as the Good Samaritan, the prodigal son, and the rich man and Lazarus, the story of the ten lepers, and the account of the resurrected Lord walking beside his disciples on the road to Emmaus. Other unique features are Luke's inclusion of teachings of John the Baptist, not found in the other Gospels his emphasis on the prayerfulness of Jesus Christ, and his inclusion of the calling, training, and missionary labors of the Seventy. Moreover, Luke is the only gospel writer to record that the Savior shed his blood in Gethsemane, and that an angel ministered to him. Because Luke's gospel begins and concludes at the temple, it also signals the temple's importance as a principal location of God's dealings with mankind. So let's jump into Luke chapter 1. From the 2016 Seminary Manual, it says, Luke specifically addressed his gospel to Theophilus, which in Greek means friend of God or beloved of God. It is apparent that Theophilus had received previous instruction concerning the life and teachings of Jesus Christ. Luke hoped to provide further instruction by offering a systematic account of the Savior's mission and ministry. He wanted those who read his testimony to know the certainty of the Son of God, his compassion, atonement, and resurrection. Another interesting feature of Luke's prologue is Luke's assertion that he had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, like it says in verse 3. This does not mean that he was an eyewitness of the Savior, but it reflects his diligence in incorporating the testimonies of eyewitnesses into his work. Remember that Luke never met Jesus, but he makes it very clear in verses 1 and 2 that he has access to many resources and accounts from eyewitnesses, accounts we don't seem to have now, since only two of the gospel writers were apostles and witnesses to many of these events. But remember that even Matthew and John, apostolic witnesses, were not witnesses to the events before they were called to follow Jesus which means even Matthew had to get his birth narrative from another source, just like Luke. It's fascinating to me that there were so many accounts in their day, like it seems to indicate in verse 1. So let's meet two very important people, Zacharias and Elizabeth. Let's start in Luke chapter 1, verse 5. And there was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abiah, And his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name 
was Elizabeth. The Institute Manual adds this insight. Centuries before the birth of Jesus, King David had divided the priests of Israel into 24 families called courses, each of which was called to serve in the temple twice a year for one week each time. Zacharias belonged to the priestly family of Abiah. Joseph Smith's translation, Luke chapter 1, verse 8, replaces the word course with priesthood. Going on with verse 6, And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. And they had no child, because that Elizabeth was barren, and they both were now well stricken in years. In the next few verses, we learn that Zacharias was appointed to burn incense in the Jerusalem temple, an honor that came to a priest perhaps only once in his lifetime. Also, this temple in Jerusalem at this time was known as Herod's Temple. King Solomon's temple was destroyed about 600 years before by King Nebuchadnezzar. About a century later, Zerubbabel led the Jews returning from Babylon in reconstruction of the temple. This temple is known as the Temple of Zerubbabel. This temple was partially burned in 37 BC, and a restoration project was started by King Herod the Great. This restoration project wouldn't be finished until 64 AD, so the temple at this time is there, but parts of it are actively being restored. This temple would be known as the Temple of Herod. For more information about these three temples, take a look at your Bible dictionary under Temple. Right. Let's go on in verse 11. And there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord, standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. Now there's a hint here that Zacharias was praying in the temple, perhaps, like he had done a hundred times before, for a child. After waiting so long, the angel announces that his prayer is heard. I see in this a parallel for the Jews They have prayed for so long for the Messiah to redeem them. Gabriel's announcement testifies that their prayers have been heard too, and that they are about to be answered. The Come Follow Me manual includes this great quote from Elder Jeffrey R. Holland from the October 2020 General Conference, where he says, While we work and wait together for the answers to some of our prayers, I offer you my apostolic promise that they are heard, and they are answered, though perhaps not at the time or in the way we wanted, but they are always answered at the time and in the way an omniscient and eternally compassionate parent should answer them, End quote. Boy, that's a good perspective. Now, in the next few verses, Luke tells us that the angel Gabriel told Zacharias that he and Elizabeth would have joy and gladness, and that their son would prepare many people for the Lord. Let's pick it up in verse 18. And Zacharias said unto the angel, Whereby shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife well stricken in years. And the angel answering said unto him, I am Gabriel, that stand in the presence of God, and am sent to speak unto thee, and to show thee these glad tidings. And behold, thou shalt be dumb, and not able to speak, until the day that these things shall be performed, because thou believest not my words, which shall be fulfilled in their season. Now we talked about this last year, but just as a reminder, as recorded in History of the Church, Volume 3, the Prophet Joseph Smith revealed that Gabriel is the same person as the Prophet Noah from the book of Genesis. In the next few verses... Luke tells us that when Zacharias left the temple, he could not speak. Elizabeth later became pregnant, as the angel had promised. She declared her feelings about this in verse 25. Thus hath the Lord dealt with me in the days wherein he looked on me to take away my reproach among men. Now we can see that Elizabeth is having a great time with the angelic visit to her husband. But for Zacharias... It seems to have been a bit of an ordeal. 
notice how often the first words out of an angel's mouth is, fear not. What might that tell you about what it's like to see a divine messenger? Verse 12 tells us that fear fell upon Zacharias. I mean, to see a heavenly messenger? That's a big deal. But in Luke chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, it tells us that in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, the angel Gabriel was sent to Mary, a young woman in Nazareth. Let's see how that goes. Starting in verse 28, And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Well, hold on a second. Where's the fear not? Let's keep going in verse 29. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what matter of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. I find it interesting that Gabriel's fear not does not seem to be in response to the shock of a heavenly being showing up. Rather, it seems to be in response to her being troubled at this particular salutation. Just a thought, but what if this is not the first time Gabriel and Mary have had a chat? Perhaps at other times, introductions were more like, Hey, Mary. What's up? I don't mean to be disrespectful, but what if Gabriel's salutation, his greeting, was much different than what she was used to and seemed to indicate an upcoming responsibility she was puzzled by. The Greek word translated as troubled does not mean scared. Some translators have used confused or perplexed to flesh out the meaning. There's nothing in this angelic experience that seems to indicate that she's surprised or uncomfortable around Gabriel at all. Their interaction to me seems rather personal. But let's carry on with the announcement. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Mary's response is similar to many we have studied who are curious how God will perform his amazing work. In verse 34, then Mary said unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month with her, who is called barren. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. Perhaps you know people that have had opinions about the conception of Jesus. It's helpful to remember what we know and what we don't. There are other prophetic authors who have given testimony to this incident, such as Matthew, Nephi, and Alma. They each emphasize that he is the Son of God, but do not reveal how this miracle took place. The Institute Manual includes a quote from Harold B. Lee. This is from the book Teachings of Harold B. Lee. He says, quote, If teachers were wise in speaking of the conception of Jesus Christ, about which the Lord has said but very little, they would rest their discussion on this subject with merely the words which are recorded on this subject in Luke chapter 1, verses 34 and 35. Let the Lord rest his case with this declaration and wait until he sees fit to tell us more. Close quote. And there's also another great quote from President Ezra Taft Benson. This comes from an Enzyme article in March 1986 called Joy in Christ. He says that Christ's birth was a miracle. Mary, quote, was called a virgin both before and after she gave birth, end quote. But imagine this. If Mary says yes, how will this change her life? Make it easier? Let's jump back to Matthew's account. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 18, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, 
When as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. The Institute Manual provides this insight. Once the marriage was agreed upon, the wedding consisted of two stages, betrothal, also called espousal, and a wedding ceremony. Betrothal was legally and religiously more significant than the subsequent marriage ceremony, after which the couple began living together. Betrothal was regarded as the final part of a solemn covenant. It carried the force of a covenant to be honored between God-fearing parties. Though betrothed couples were legally regarded as husband and wife, between the time of betrothal and the wedding ceremony, a strict code of chastity was enforced. So she is betrothed or espoused. How is the pregnancy going to go over with Joseph? How is it going to go over in her small Jewish town? In everyone else's eyes, she will appear to be complicit in a shameful scandal. What will they say about her character? Will she be shamed from social life? What will friends say? What about her family? How will they react and how will this situation affect their standing in their small community? Strains that the very best of them, she who is highly favored of God, will be seen as the worst and vilest of sinners. But knowing all that, how did she respond when the Lord called her to this great work? Let's go back to Luke chapter 1. Let's start in verse 38. And Mary said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. But how did Joseph react? If things were as they appeared, Mary betrayed him and showed the worst kind of character. Joseph had several options. Again from the Institute Manual. First, he could have subjected Mary to a public divorce and perhaps even execution, for people would have presumed that Mary was guilty of adultery a crime punishable by death under the law of Moses. Second, Joseph could have had his betrothal to Mary privately annulled before two witnesses. A third option was to proceed with the marriage. Going back to Matthew chapter 1, starting in verse 19, Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. What do we learn about Joseph's character from this choice? Very impressive. Let's keep going in verse 20. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost, and she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and he knew her not, till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Notice here how Matthew focuses on the birth narrative through Joseph's experience. Joseph had the vision and was given the name of the child, Jesus. But Luke focused on Mary's experience with the angel, telling her what to name the child. Now certainly, these things could both have happened, but each author only focuses on the events that form the theological narrative they are telling about Jesus. They choose the events they will share depending on what they are teaching about him. But we're jumping ahead a little. Let's go back to the book of Luke, chapter 1. After the angel appeared to Mary, let's take a look at verse 39, Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste into a city of Judah and entered into the house of Zacharias and saluted Elizabeth, And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. So Elizabeth is about to testify about Mary, but while she does, 
Look for what Mary had done that allowed the Lord to do great things for her. Going on in verse 42, And she, this is Elizabeth, spake out with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. And whence is this to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For lo, as soon as the voice of thy salutation sounded in mine ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. And blessed is she that believed, for there shall be a performance of those things which were told her from the Lord. And Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. For he hath regarded the low estate of his handmaiden. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. For he that is mighty hath done to me great things, and holy is his name. And his mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. He hath showed strength. With his arm, he hath scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He hath put down the mighty from their seats, and exalted them of low degree. He hath filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he hath sent empty away. He hath holpen his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, as he spake to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his seed forever. And Mary abode with her about three months and return to her own house. Do you ever wonder what might change in our lives if we responded to the Lord like Mary did? Incidentally, verses 46 through 55 make up a sacred Latin text called the Magnificat, which in Latin means to magnify. Many composers over the centuries have set these words to beautiful music. The rest of Luke chapter 1 finishes the account of the birth of John, who would be called the Baptist. After Elizabeth gave birth, Zacharias affirmed that the child should be named John using a writing tablet, as he still couldn't speak. When he did so, he immediately regained his ability to speak, and he prophesied about the missions of Jesus Christ and John. And similarly to Mary's words earlier, Zacharias' words in verses 67 through 79, are the text of the Benedictus in Latin, which means blessed. These words have also been set to music by many composers over the centuries. Now, the Institute Manual offers this commentary. It says the first chapter in Matthew announces that Jesus Christ would be called in Hebrew, Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. The last verse in Matthew contains the Savior's promise to his disciples, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. By placing these parallel declarations at the beginning and the end of his gospel, Matthew may be identifying a message running throughout the gospel of Matthew. God will not forget us. He is with us always. Nice. I like that. The Come Follow Me manual asks the question, why is it important to you to know that Jesus was both the Son of God and the Son of Mary? President Russell M. Nelson explained that the atonement of Jesus Christ, quote, required a personal sacrifice by an immortal being not subject to death, yet he must die and take up his own body again. The Savior was the only one who could accomplish this. From his mother he inherited power to die. From his father he obtained power over death. End quote. That's from the October 1993 General Conference. How exciting is this to get started here in the New Testament and having an introduction to the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. This is very exciting. Indeed. So that's all the time we have today. Keep reading your scriptures, and we'll look forward to talking to you more about them in our next lesson. We'll see you then. This podcast is not officially affiliated with The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. But we're really big fans.